Aye. That passed unanimously, <laughs> slowly, but unanimously. And this brings us to our conference agenda. First up is Measure B-2012, the Citizens Parcel Tax Oversight Committee 2013-14 Annual Report. Dr. Cash. Well, we're very fortunate tonight. We have not only Mr. Handel on the dais, but we have uh, his chairperson from Measure B. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Colin Bell up to the podium. Thank you, Colin. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to serve uh, previously on the Measure I and now the P Measure B <coughs> committees. And um, it is uh, something that uh, uh, we get to see each principal and uh, the personality of each school, uh, how they spend their funds. And uh, it's something that I wish uh, more people in the community could see. So uh, with that, I'll walk through some of these uh, slides. I believe most of you probably have already seen this. I know that the uh, per parcel tax was increased from the previous measures, and uh, I, I, I'm glad that it was approved and has gone through, and it only allows the schools, uh, obviously, to fund more activities and uh, arts and the science and the technology. And uh, we do have a couple vacancies. We had a couple people drop, but uh, it sounds like we may be getting one more on our board moving forward. And uh, I think that's out there. Uh, this is a breakdown of the funds uh, throughout this year, the last calendar year. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions there. Do you want to have questions as we go along? Any or questions on this? Mr. Heron? Well, it might be good to clarify that $101,000 ending fund, that it's really money that was allocated out but just not spent yet. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that is, uh, that is correct. I guess it, there is... It, most of the funds, I believe, the principals that was allocated, they spent, but uh, there is some, uh, Conrad may speak to this better, but I think I, mm -hmm. that there is some flexibility is knowing what funds are coming in as it, you have senior exemptions and some other things like that, so. Mm -hmm. We don't budget out every last dollar from one year to the next with, you know, a lot of it goes to um, the teacher salaries and the music program, aren't not directly to a site allocation. Mm -hmm. So with fluctuations in salaries and benefits and open positions and things like that, we don't, in, you know, when we're in the middle, we don't budget at all. So we have a cushion from one year to the next to make sure, but by the end, it will all be spent. <laughs> yes. As you can see, uh, the bulk of the money is spent on salaries that are going to music teachers and technology. Uh, I, I would say even in that broken down even further, uh, I believe there was one school that had a full-time technology uh, support staff and uh, a couple others that had partial. Majority of that is going to the music program. Uh, which you can see, uh, we didn't have a list, but if I, there's, it would probably be the length of my arm, the number of music events that the schools are putting on in the community, uh, around the holidays, around back to school nights, and those sorts of things. So uh, the math and the science and the technology there, uh, most of that, a lot of that is going to the iPad, uh, a lot of iPad allocation one to one. Some of the schools are trying to achieve that through these funds. So, <laughs> I guess that, that slide's more of the same. <laughs> uh, and then moving on goes to the individual school breakdown. And this is purely based on attendance, enrollment. But just going back to that slide for a moment, it's really clear that m most of the money stays at the district to pay for presumably music since such a small amount is going out to each of the sites. Okay.
And so uh, I think, you know, again, we hear from all the principals how they're spending their money, and I th the resounding theme coming back from them is they appreciate the flexibility that they have. Again, like I say, each school has its own personality, and the principals are able to use this money uh, which best fits <coughs> into their their need and their their own community there. And uh, it's, it, it, I think, has been a great success with this bond measure. So I think that's the extent of my report. All right, any further questions on it? I'd like to add, I want to thank Mr. Bell and Mr. Tedeschi for um, all of their uh, support and their, their leadership on the committee. They provide a lot of uh, a lot of uh, information to the committee. Um, Mr. Bell and being brave enough to come here tonight and present this information, it, it really speaks a lot um, about him and, and all the committee members that come on a regular basis to the to these meetings to ensure that every dollar that we spend from from these uh, from the monies we ask from our from our community are spent wisely and in accordance with what we promised. So I want to thank Mr. Bell publicly and all of the committee members. I wish they were here and also thank Mr. Tedeschi for doing all the bookkeeping and all, and all this. Thank you both. I have one. Ms. Edelson. I just have a question. So if you were visiting all these sites and you saw something that you didn't feel was of value, um, how would, what would be the procedure that you'd go through to, um, would you just share that with the principal or the music teacher at that site or would you let the district know and how has that happened? Uh, it has not happened with measure B. did happen some with measure I, I believe, okay. before. And uh, the committee doesn't have a lot of teeth to it. We found out. We can't tell them that we don't approve what they're doing or, mm -hmm. but it is a forum for us to discuss. Uh, I think some of it uh, we some of the charter schools, uh, we asked them to come back a second time mm -hmm. and discuss their plan a little further in detail. And uh, once we kind of work through just, um, I guess, further communication with them, uh, we wanted to make sure that they were actually in, in line with some of the th goals that the district had, because uh, we saw, we thought the other schools were really following some of the technology things that the district had and some of the charter schools were uh, maybe had not been informed of that and seemed like they weren't on the same page. And so uh, it worked out the last time mm -hmm. in just having a second meeting and a continued conversation. Uh, I have not seen any reason to raise a red flag further, but I guess it is good to know that uh, this probably would be the best for the next step to come uh, to the board if we felt like there was something different uh, okay. that we needed to bring to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Aaron. As I understand it, the key question is, were the funds spent in accordance with the uh, parcel tax issue on the, on the ballot? Yes. And I presume your answer to that question is yes. Yes. The committee might disagree in what the district is doing, but as long as it falls under that auspices of, of the measure on the ballot, like you say, your hands are sort of tied. But we welcome any comments you have, regardless of whether it's <laughs> relating just to that, but uh, what you do is fantastic. Okay. Well, I'll just add one last thing. Go Giants. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bell. Right on. <laughs> oh, poor Mr. Dedeski. <laughs> All right. Um, Thank you. And we're moving on to G2. This is a one-to-one -one iPad update. And board members, we do have um, a handout that is on the dais and presumably will be. Do we have any extra copies of the handout? I did not get one. Thank you, Mr. Rickman. And presumably this will be being attached to the item for the public as well. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cash? So, thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, a periodic update on the one-to-one -one iPad. You're also going to get one again on the evaluation survey coming up soon as well because we're just about done with that. Um, and I hope that will be November 18th and if not then December 9th for sure. So, with that, Todd Rickman. 
Good evening, Madam President, board members. I just wanted to take a little bit of your time to, to give you an update on our one-to-one -one program or pilot. Uh, I first wanted to acknowledge the, the hard work of our fabulous teachers, administrators, tech coaches, and, and the, the district team that has made this, this pilot possible. Uh, there, are incredible, there are incredible things going on in the classrooms, uh, and it's all thanks to our fabulous teachers, who are all listed here. So um, I wanted just to give you uh, numbers initially for the one-to-one the -one pilot. Uh, what you see here is a breakdown of each of the individual schools participating in the one-to-one, -one, whether the number of uh, district-provided iPads, the number of parents or, or families that are participating in Invest for Learn, those families that chose to purchase their own iPad and let their students use it, uh, and those iPads that yet need to be distributed uh, this school year. So you'll see that distribution at Adams actually happened today. And Franklin, we are still working on um, a date when we can get third graders their iPads there. Yes, ma'am. Are these numbers as of today or as of the beginning of the school year? Or These are as of today. Today, thank you. Yes. Mr. Heron. The Adams 80, and they were done today, was that to new third graders this year? Correct. Does Washington not have new third graders? or We already... We already right distributed, those? yes. And Franklin has? So Franklin still has a, a 100 third graders that need to have their iPads distributed to them. We've already distributed to La Cuesta and Washington, and Adams happened today. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions on the slide? So w one of the things that has, has been, you know, a nice, um, outcome of this is that we now have lots of iPads at some of our junior highs from our sixth graders that graduated from the one-to-one -one pilot schools and participated in Invest for Learning and took their iPads to the junior high. So it's nice to see an influx of technology into those schools that aren't in a one-to-one -one yet or participating in the pilot. Uh, this was a big question that we had when we talked about a lot about breakage and theft and loss. So as you can see, our numbers are, are fairly low. Uh, in all of third through sixth grade, we've had six iPads lost or stolen, and ninth through twelfth, six iPads lost or stolen. Um, I wanted to give you an idea of, of the apps we have deployed on the iPads. So at third grade, we've deployed 43 apps for teachers' use. These are, these are apps that teachers requested get pushed to the devices to use as part of their instruction. So 43 in third grade, 44 in fourth, and so on, for a total of 169 apps that teachers requested to be installed in the iPads. And may I assume that there's duplication in those that, that some fourth graders, fourth grade teachers want? Absolutely, to yes. Okay. Here's a list of the apps I included in case you wanted to look. That what's interesting in this one is that 56 of the apps are free, and another 12 uh, are we, we paid for. So the teachers are doing a lot of work with apps that are free. Uh, an Invest for Learning update. We've collected uh, $49,000 in payments approximately. Uh, from our Invest for Learn families, and uh, 165 families have not made payments. And I wanted to talk about this number for a second because it's not that the families don't want to, aren't capable. There's some issues with Invest for Learn that we have to to look at that make it uh, difficult. Uh, they they don't Invest for Learn doesn't have a 1-800 number that you can call if you have questions. Invest for Learning doesn't have uh, their documentation that they send to families isn't very clear about what to do if you're having a problem making a payment. So a lot of this, th these 160 families is is because we don't have in place anyone that can help families who are having difficulty making Invest for Learn payments. Um, there are some families that come to the district that we're able to help. There are some families that go to um, school sites. But overall, and I'm going to let the, the principal speak to this in a second, that this is, this is a, a pain point for us. 
So I'm going to ask the principals to, to come up and speak uh, just really briefly about what they're seeing in their classrooms. Where What I asked them specifically is, is to talk about on the SAMR model, which I, I believe we went over once before, where they're seeing the iPads used. Are they are they getting above that? Are the teachers getting above that line from enhancement to transformation, like like we're hoping for in their instruction? Um, I want to. Casey Kilgore is sick, so she texted me and asked if she could go home, and I was like, of course. And I want to, uh, you know, publicly apologize to Fran, who's a huge Giants fan and is here, sulking in the back of the room. So I imagine they're losing right now. But uh, could I could I have you guys could, could I please uh, we can start with whoever wants to go first. Absolutely, Dr. Paz. Yeah, uh, some of the um, principals could answer this. So I'm looking at the list of apps deployed, just uh, for my own information purposes. So Dropbox I can get in terms of sharing documents and stuff. Evernote. Who's using Evernote? And how are they using it? That would be great. So also, can I ask um, Celinda Muller and Wendy Mirbach from my department to come up? Because they've also helped out a lot with especially the apps and, and working with teachers on apps. So they might be able to give you some information also. Go ahead. Great. Uh, it's funny that you just mentioned that. I was just talking to Mr. Federbush, my fifth grade teacher today, about Evernote and how their students are using it. And they use it on a daily basis, actually. Mm -hmm. And they, he pushes assignments out in mm -hmm. Evernote and writing assignments in Evernote. And then um, from there, they push it onto KidBlog. And from KidBlog, students uh, respond to one another, mm -hmm. uh, one another's writing. He responds to their writing as well. And then community members. So he has a partnership with Partners in Education, and he has about 10 community members who he has um, set as a cohort mm -hmm. that respond to the student's writing as well. And so when I walked into the student's classroom and I asked them today, what is the favorite thing that you like to do with your iPad? All of the students writing. If I would have walked in that classroom last year at the same time, I would have not got that answer. And I said, why do you like writing so much? I love to see what students are going to say about my writing. And can I go first then? <laughs> <laughs> you got me started, Dr. Paz. <laughs> no, you can't say no. <laughs> and so, um, you know, when it comes to the SAMR model and, and, and looking at the SAMR model and the redefinition that are in the SAMR model and what the iPads have done for us is um, backing up a little bit is that professional development component and starting with the Common Core State Standards was that we want our students to learn and that technology component as well, as you know, you've heard me talk about the teachers and that tech piece, we would not be where we are today had our teachers not invested in themselves first. And so that is critical, and that is the number one key um, to success with student iPads, I believe. As well as students having, a, or teachers first have a firm understanding and what formative assessments are. So we backed the train up and said, what are formative assessments? Because we all know the work and looking at the research behind Rick Stiggins and his research and that if teachers are implement formative assessments with fidelity, that's when you see gains in student improvement and student achievement. And so what the iPads have done for us is in fourth through sixth grade, and I'm going to speak to fourth through sixth grade because that's what we've been using. You saw that we implemented third grade today, is that all of my fourth or sixth grade teachers are proficient, I will say, in EDU. And so you've heard about EDU in junior high and high school, and how they're using EDU is to help students. So students are progress monitoring their own work every single day in all core subject areas. So that's not only the classroom teacher, but that also involves the PE teacher the art teacher and the music teacher. So music assignments are in EDU as well. And so when I ask students, how are you doing? They can tell me specifically their strengths and their stretches. And then I can look in EDU as well and say, mm, I see this is where you're struggling with. What are you doing to get back on track? And so it's holding students accountable, and if they need extra support, what are we doing as a school site to give them that extra support? So we have Saturday school, so from 9 to 12, so we're not letting a long time go by 
It's every Saturday, 9 to 12. You're coming in. We're giving you extra support. And then I also hang that over their heads, too. So today, I was looking at students' work. And I said, your A accelerated reader, that's their reading goals for their month, is October 31st. And they know that they have to have 45 minutes a day of reading and an average comprehension score of 85% or higher on those quizzes. And so if they don't, then they have to come to Saturday school. I said, do you, I need to call your mom right now, or where are you at in your book? Are you going to have this finished? And you also know that the comprehension is equally as important as those minutes and duration of reading. So there has those conversations not only with the classroom teacher, but the principal, as well as the support specialist so that no student slips through the cracks. I would not have been able to do that had the students not had the iPad and that support of formative assessments, not only from them, but also from each other. Because they don't want to let each other down. So nobody wants to post a writing that's not a well-written piece. Because then you'll say, hey, what was that? And so there's also edu creations. So that's another example of before we had the iPads, you would have saw a student in fifth grade um, giving a state report with a with a poster paper and maybe some pictures on it and some writing and they would talk about it and everyone would take turns talking about it. Maybe they would work in cooperative groups, but there wasn't. Well, were you the recorder, right? Were you the were the person drawing? So what the iPad does is holds every student accountable because everybody has to create their own report and then they post it and and they're talking to the report in the background and there's video clips in the report and then there's student writing in the report and then they're commenting and they're using a rubric so they know the rubric they know what the expectation is their exemplars also in there so they know okay what 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 does a four look like and so instead of before you would have, a teacher would have a four paper in front and everyone would look at that four and then the student would go home and go, oh gosh, I don't remember what that four was. Now a student can go and eat a year and they can look at it and they can play it over again and go, oh, I know what that is. But what also is great is there's a parent component. And what I am so, so proud of my teachers is that they've committed to providing professional development for parents this year. So professional development and EDU. So they're training parents on how to read the reports in EDU for their child. So we've already hosted two evening sessions, but it also goes hand in hand with AVID. So it's not a disconnect with, oh, it's just technology. No, it's not just technology. It's we want our, chi our children to be college and career ready, and this is the pathway to get there, and this is how you can progress monitor your child as well at home. So every single month, Parents are getting support in English and Spanish and how to read EDU and support that with their child at home. And so I will say, and I'm a huge fan of EDU, <laughs> I, I, would, I would say we would not be where we're, at, where we're at today had my teachers first not took the step and said, this is what we need to do to be successful for our children. And so... If I can tell you one thing that I've learned through this process is that I am so thankful we invested in our teachers because our teachers are going full force and, and they're just learning from each other and sharing best practices from each other. So I could talk more if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go through her? Sure. Um, so I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the iPad rollout, and I wanted to thank uh, Wendy and Zelinda and Todd for getting the iPads out to my community. I wanted to let you know that the ones that were owned by the district were collected last year and passed out really quickly in the beginning of the year. Uh, the lessons learned from that distribution were, was that we should probably take the passcode off because the students came back and couldn't remember it, so our tech people spent a lot of time wiping it, but they were brought back in a timely fashion. Teachers had them in the beginning of the year to implement. It took a little bit longer for my new fourth through sixth graders to get theirs because um, they needed to be ordered. They were behind and um, the back, back of the house illuminate issues, which we got that straightened out. So that was reassuring. So those were distributed and then we spent a lot of time and I really want to acknowledge um, my school's secretaries for their work because they went into Illuminate and made sure that everyone's, um, all the parents email address was correct and didn't bounce back so that when Wendy sent out the airdrop message 
Um, the parents could access it. They could set up their account. So when we came in, we were able to roll out 100 iPads, 103 iPads in one day of training. It was very smooth. We had only lost the computer lab for one day. Um, we had a full team there. We had a Spanish meeting with translation and interpretation services. And it was, by and large, really, really successful. Compared to last year, I wasn't there, but I heard really, really good positive things. And then as far as iPads being used, the third grade is just now starting to get to use them. Fourth and sixth, I would concur with what Amy said about EDU. EDU is a fabulous resource. It allows for instant feedback. It allows for um, students and parents to track their their progress, um, and it's a really valuable tool. It's also a resource that teachers use to share knowledge. So for example, the fifth grade writing calibration, uh, one of Amy's teachers um, did a teacher-friendly rubric, and he was able to push that out to all of the fifth grade team so that they could find it. So we're finding that students are using it and teachers are using EDU. And then um, for Todd's question, I spent some time looking at how we were implementing the iPads and how we were using it. And there is definitely some substitution type things, research that's replacing a thesaurus or an encyclopedia, but it's really empowering research and the kids are really excited about doing it. Um, augmentation, I think that's where apps come into play. One of the things that we are using a lot at my site is um, um, Dreambox for Math, and that helps with their math facts. Uh, Lexia, um, Reading Plus, and AR to a lesser extent. And that is really powerful because in fifth grade, they're using that as homework. So they're not in class necessarily reading, but they go home and read 20 to 30 minutes a night. They take that AR test, or if it's Lexia, it's um, it's kind of computer adapted, similar to what they will face in Smarter Balance as it, it identifies their reading level and then gives them their gaps and challenges. So we found that really helpful and it's come up, the teachers bring that materials with them for the SST meetings when students are identified and it's a really powerful piece to communicate where students are at in terms of data for um, our teachers. Uh, in terms of Augmentation, I would also say that AirDrop, AirDrop is both an opportunity and a challenge because uh, students share information with one another and that's really empowering but we also have to make sure that they are on task and that has been an issue and that we are working for solutions towards. Uh, mirroring, the fact that they can mirror their work and share with their colleagues is really exciting for students and they're eager to do that. Um, this is closer on the substitution augmentation side but just using the iPad as a whiteboard for math, they're doing their arrays and um, plotting and doing the common core math. It's really exciting for them to be able to, to show their work and say, well, I did it like this, well, I did it like this, and um, it's in making a lot of for enriched conversation. Uh, modification, I would think that um, the apps also play into this. Hopscotch is really popular. Um, they're using the keynote a lot to do presentations. Um, they're also designing things. So they wrote with their iPad a skit, then they performed the skit, filmed the skit, and then shared the skit. So they're doing different things um, in different classes. Notability is quite popular. Um, let's see what else. So they still do the reports. Uh, Amy had mentioned that, you know, the days of the tripod, a trifold presentation, those are still there. What my teachers have found is that they like to vary it. So like for astronomy, which lends itself to the NASA app, which is awesome, they're doing an electronic report. But they are still doing like a lot of hand reports too because they want that writing, that collaboration time. Uh, collaboration, I think, is the biggest opportunity for iPads because what they can do is they can take a task in like EDU, say a math um, like assessment type question and put it in a group. And now that group is responsible for coming up with the solution to that math problem. And the teacher can see who's inputting, who's not, who's participating. It's much better than when you would hand them a sheet and say, okay, now rate your, your group's participation. They're like, oh, they're all nice, they all get. So, and it encourages them, they want to respond to it. They can go home and respond to it. So it happens in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Uh, with that said, we have parents that are concerned 
about the use of technology and iPad screen time. And we definitely invite them to talk to us, to come visit, and to participate in the classroom. And when they do, I think usually what they see is there's a, a good balance there, that it's not all screen time, that we're really using it purposefully um, as a resource for Alexia or Dreambox to help with the math facts and the reading levels, or as a modification to allow a task to be redesigned, to do something that they couldn't do in the past, like make a collage and um, assess it for advertising techniques. So they all made these collages, they, they shared them out, and then the students had to go back and identify which per persuasive techniques were embedded in that collage, and that's really helping them with their opinion writing. Newsomatic is popular, Avid Weekly is used. So I'm seeing a lot of really good uses of technology. All right. Um. EDU is the first thing on my list, and I would say that it's been transformative to the community of La Cuesta in that we are able to, um, we implemented an advisory period this year, and we use, um, so having everything housed in EDU is huge, and part of what we do in advisory is having, we have students, uh, they know how to write SMART goals now. They. Um, they're given assignments to about every three weeks email me or or send a message through edu to me or to mr castellanos on whether they met their smart goal or not um, the teachers everything is housed in there so students who are away from school when they come back it's all there and that's so all our messages are there. I mean, every everything lives in EDU. So having every student be able to access it is really big. And, and really, I could tell you how big it's been, but you, you kind of have to see it and live it and every day just be watching what's going on with the EDU and the way that the, the teachers have embraced it and the students will be rolling it out and training um, parents at the second semester. So that's that's our next step. So it's that parent communication piece um, from the LCAP that we're focusing on with that. Um, a lot of the same things just in different flavors at the high school level with what um, my co-principals have, have shared tonight, research both in the moment. Uh, I heard a student say today, how old is Ray Bradbury? You know, they're reading Fahrenheit 451. Look it up, so look it up. So there's that in the moment sort of curiosity that they can just find the answer. But then also, of course, the, the long-term research. Um, we use IXL at La Cuesta. We, uh, 11th and 12th graders are taking their KC retakes next week. So IXL in the KC math class has been really great because students, it, it, um, it individualizes itself to the students. So they, they use that a couple times a week in their KC prep class. I mean, everything, um, graphing calculators, FitBrain, which is, uh, we're working on mind, um, uh, mindset, growth mindset, so being able to actually um, train the brain and of course Google Drive and pages and numbers, the, the whole thing. Um, it was interesting because Todd and, and uh, Dr. Drotty came in today to visit and there was almost no iPad use when they were there, um, but we are using it them very, very <laughs> regularly. <laughs> it's like, of course, class after class. Um, an example today, though, that I saw was um, in conceptual physics. They've been uh, working for weeks on planning and building their bridges, and they were testing their bridges today. So they had they had been using their iPads through the process to do research and so forth. They built their bridge today. They had to take a pic before and after pictures of the bridges, but also conversion from uh, English to metric on the weight. So, you know, go over, grab the iPad, and use a conversion app. So it's just, uh, I, I asked all of the teachers to say, tell me every, everything you've been using the iPad for in the last five weeks. Send it to me. I asked them to email me in preparation for this, and, uh, and I was like, oh, 
where are we going to be on the SAMR? Where are we going to be? So when I started looking at things, we're, we're in modification and augmentation for the most part. Um, a little, of course, redefinite. None of it's bad, but, but really we are more and more, as we move to the apps, moving into that augmentation. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of redefinition yet. Um, but the substitution is, of course, always there. I want to say one last thing. Students taking pictures of the board, and I started seeing this and seeing it, and then why are kids taking pictures of the board? And the teachers, are, a couple teachers told me, they can't see the board. Can't see the board? So that started this whole effort to work through C International and the county if they have Medi-Cal to get them glasses and vision care. So I was blown away. So that was kind of a, a huge side aha of the iPads was they were using it for that purpose. So wow. anyway, questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, yeah, it looks like next on our list, yeah. Mr. Rickman, is questions, questions and, and concerns. Yes. So um, these are just things that I, I was thinking about. Um, you know, this is a pilot, and so uh, we need to look at our strengths and stretches. Um, so there's a couple things. Uh, one right now, teachers uh, currently cannot manage the iPads remotely. That was a, a promise that was made to us by our, our MDM company. Uh, they did develop an app, but then char wanted to charge us $3 a device to use it. So I was like, yeah, no. Um, so we've come up with another plan, though, to, to address that. But right now, that's a challenge for teachers, that they can't lock iPads down, that they can't lock kids into single app mode, that there's things that, that teachers really need to be able to do in the classroom that they can't right now. Uh, creating Apple IDs uh, for students has been problematic. It's it's a necessity to get our mobile device manager to work, and it's, it's, it's not an easy process. I would say it's probably what we take, spend most of our time doing. Would you guys agree? Um, Managing Invest for Learning accounts is cumbersome. I, I, I spoke to that a little bit when I was talking about the, the, the 165 uh, uh, families who we haven't gotten payments from, not because they don't want to pay, but because of how cumbersome Invest for Learning is. Um, I, I wonder, and when I walk around classes, um, we've done a lot of work in professional development, and our tech coaches have done a great job. Um, but I want to be able to, to, to come and report to you that we're above that line more often than not, that we're just not using devices you know, as a substitute. Uh, to me, it, th that's a lot of money to spend for something that it just substitutes something else. Um, one of the things we're finding is, you know, 16 gigabyte iPads might be too small for what we're doing. Uh, teachers have the, the kids doing so much and putting so much information on that we're, we're running out of space. And we learned that when we went to update to iOS 8 and you need a free you need a lot of space to update over the air. And uh, we had devices that we couldn't update because we were out of space. And then the, the other question that, that I think about a lot is, do we, do we really need a device um, that allows for redefinition and modification? Or would a device that allows for only substitution and augmentation be sufficient for what we're trying to do as a district? I think that's a question we have to ask. Um, you know, Chromebooks are very good at doing substitution and, and augmentation. Um, they're not as good as doing at doing redefinition and modification. Um, so it, it's about priorities and and what we want uh, for the students. I will, you know, anytime I, I ask myself this question, you know, there's there's arguments on both sides. Like if you go out to DP or San Marcos where they have iPad carts, the teachers fight over them. Who can who's going to get the iPad carts because they're doing so much stuff at San Marcos and DP with those iPad carts in this. Uh, redefinition and modification area uh, and using labs less but then you go other places and, and you know the iPads are being used you know mainly for accessing EDU or, or other things which you can do on a Chromebook just fine so I think these are questions that we need to really examine uh, moving forward so I'd be happy to take questions or Dr. Paz so one of the questions as, as you all were speaking um, 
because it is we're looking at a pilot year and trying to learn lessons learned and then spread that knowledge whoosh, everywhere across the district if we ever want to move in this direction so have we um, I guess this question would be t to Mr. Rickman have we started to look at how we're gonna document our lessons learned like a lot of the pieces that you're talking about was any of this shared um, at our um, teacher training that we did in the beginning of the school year? Are we planning to do anything like that? Um, because some of the, the pieces of information that you all shared is because your teachers are working together and they're sharing that information and you're learning because you're going out there. And so some of that same sort of um, methodology would work, you know, with looking at it in terms of the district. And even if we don't go past beyond these four schools, that some of these lessons learned would be applicable to a lot of the things that we would do as a district even moving forward so not having that. Yeah, we have a it's, a, it's a great question. We have a very robust tech coaching program and our tech coaches work across the district with integrators. So this information is being shared all the time. Uh, even though the tech coaches has, haven't been specifically assigned to um, work in the iPad one-to-one -one, uh, pilot, they're, they're in really, really involved. They're at these sites training all the time. They're working, uh, they're meeting with me regularly. So that information is being shared across. And we're also taking notes <laughs> of things that, you know, I, I'm glad to hear that that this year's uh, distribution went better than last year's. So we're learning as we go, which is, is positive. But yes, it's being shared across the district. And just to add to that too, that teachers are sharing across the district. For example, in elementary, we've made a commitment that all sixth grade students will be using EDU. So Mr. Cooper, Rob Cooper, sixth grade teacher of mine, was one of the very first elementary teachers to use EDU. So in their professional learning communities that are district wide, they're sharing resources with each other in English language arts and in math. And so actually, um, all the Common Core lessons are being vetted that way. And then fifth grade teachers are kind of getting a flavor in fifth grade because we have been using it in fifth grade well. And you can see that you know they're using it at, at Washington and then other fifth grade teachers at other schools as well. So they're supporting each other, which is really great to see. And you know, last year they did those professional development series for teachers and teaching each other in the fall and in the spring. And now it's just been organic through our professional learning communi communities that happen district-wide monthly. So instead of them being formalized on paper, they're happening through English language arts and math, which is therefore not seen as just tech. It's like, how does it connect to student learning? And core subject areas. I'll also add that we're about to unveil a, um, a technology blog that uh, our integrators are doing. It used to be that we had the integrators write up what they were, were doing and post it on Google Docs, but that really didn't benefit anyone except for people who had access to it. So now we're, we're going to have all our integrators post once a month on our technology blog and share what they're doing in their classrooms. So we're doing that. Um, and it's it's a lot of it is what they're doing with specific apps, um, and then another another piece at 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 our secondary schools, they one of PLC a month a tech integrator is spending talking about how they integrate technology into uh, the curriculum for for specific. Um, disciplines. So an English teacher is in the tech, uh, the English PLC, saying this is this is how I used Dreambox, not Dreambox, because that would be math, not English. But this is how I used Evernote uh, to accomplish this task, and you guys might consider doing it. So we're definitely trying to expand that. One thing I want to add is that uh, once a month, before our principal leadership team, Todd, Amy, um, Fran, and Casey? Casey all meet together to talk about the iPad pilot and a lot of the reflection happens there and Wendy's there and we talk about issues and what we could do to tweak it and then they've been very responsive in helping us with getting our needs met. And I know that Todd has probably already talked to you guys about um, a survey and that's another way that we're going to get input back from our community and our stakeholders as far as our t uh, students, our teachers and our parents will be taking a survey. Um, on iPad Pilot and our rollout and implementation, and we'll, we will get a lot of data from that that we can reflect on. And I'm just going to pause for a moment and just remind the board at this point that we're running 
far over on this particular item um, and we can continue the conversation but we may need to shorten things coming up so keep that in mind as you ask your questions Ms. Eidelson just had a couple questions um, on the ones that were stolen or lost were they turned to brick and just haven't recovered them or we assume okay uh, because yeah I, I assume that it worked uh, you know only one of them was actually we got a call we got back the Santa Maria Police Department called and said we have one of your iPads that somebody mm -hmm. was trying to sell up here so we have one of them back actually so that number should be one less uh, but I assume that they turned to break we, we really haven't had uh, much of an issue okay uh, 12 out of all those iPads is is and to, to me is an acceptable and then I just curious the age group that it, we've um, piloted this with is everybody feeling that this has been appropriate so second grade well, no third third third, yeah, third okay six. and have they seemed responsible to bring them back to school and sometimes leave them at school I take it if they don't need them that day or are they always going back and forth our, our students take them back and forth. Um, we haven't had really any issues with them. A couple times they'll come to the classroom and say, come to the office and say, I left mine in the iPad and we'll unlock it or we'll lock it in um, our office if we find it. But I haven't seen them laying around. Mm -hmm. They're really good about um, the school rule, which is that the iPad is supposed to be used as a tool. So during like recess and lunch, they're supposed to be playing and engaging in that type of activity. So they're not to be used during that time. And um, the RAP program as well as child development has been really um, proactive in helping us maintain that emphasis that mm -hmm. iPads are used during the homework Hour, hour, scholar hour, and not uh, to play games, you know, before or after school. So I haven't seen it be a problem for any of the grades. Good. And well, um, I, I yeah. want to make sure we know <laughs> that I think there's a big difference between the high school experience and the elementary experience in that area. Mm -hmm. and, and I appreciate that Todd has been honest about, you know, we we sold this to our teachers that we'd be able they'd be able to lock kids down into the apps and and we're still working on doing that and that's been a frustration for my teachers mm -hmm. because teenagers are different animals than fourth graders and mm -hmm. so um, that has been a struggle I would be um, but we're you know we're working with that and uh, and so we you know. It's, it's all part of what we do as educators. So. And real quick, the last question, when you say it's been challenging with the Apple ID, is there, I mean, other districts that are going through the same thing, or is that because, can we do like the EDU where you just use part of their ID number? Or? Yeah, you know, um, it's a great question again. Uh, we found that Apple bends over backwards for really large districts, like LA Unified. <laughs> Uh, Didn't they do them a whole lot of good, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> they, um, well, you know, you'd be surprised if you talked to ac people who actually worked in that there that they they were able to do Apple IDs really quickly for all those that, that we are trying to convince them to do the same process for us. And we're actually going to be meeting with them uh, second week of November to talk about a way to make that process easier. They have actually taken a lot of our suggestions and implemented them. Um, so we just need an easier way to get the Apple IDs done. And, and they've been very accommodating. So we'll, they're, they're, they're a huge company. They move a little slowly. They're not super agile. So I'm hoping that that piece will get better. OK, thank you. Mr. Heron. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, this is a pilot. When can we expect recommendations to go to stage two? Well, you're first going to look at the evaluation instrument, and the evaluation instrument will be part of the data, the data we get will help inform the recommendation that we'll make. So uh, we hope we make it sometime in the springtime. It would have to be part of the LCAP planning process. Okay, and the second is, um, will we get a financial um, analysis of the iPad distribution? Uh, sure. Because it was all predicated on certain things happening, and. X dollars were allocated, but hopefully did, we didn't spend all those X dollars. Be nice to know. Reality versus budget. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I just have one question, and that is, for some of these concerns, do we have a timeline um, when some of these concerns are going to be addressed? Are these just ongoing? Um, it sounds like 
they're all being dealt with now, but my hope is that we would have more information about these concerns so before uh, let the me next go th session. I'll just go through them really quickly. So the iPads not being able to manage being managed remotely, uh, we are changing MDM vendors. That's scheduled to happen um, the second week of November. Uh, to a company that has a similar product but provides their teaching tool to districts for free. Uh, we were paying $6 a device for the MDM. This company that we are with now wanted to add $3 a device to allow teachers to do some of the types of things I'm saying. So we're moving to, like I said, another company that, that won't charge that $3 fee. Creating Apple IDs, uh, you know, we've gotten somewhat of a handle on it. We're hoping that Apple will make it easier for us to do. Um, Invest for learning. This is a conversation that we, we've had in our meeting regularly, um, and I don't have any good answers for that one right now. Um, that might involve figuring out a way, if we were to roll this out district-wide, hiring somebody who managed Invest for Learning. That would be my recommendation at this point in time. Um, the SAMR model, we just introduced the SAMR model to teachers this year. So I assume, I mean, from my visits and talking to uh, tech coaches and integrators, we're beginning to see transformation in the, that area. But this is the first year that we've rolled it out, so we'll see. Um, 16 gigabyte iPads, that's a discussion if we ever move forward on this pilot, whether we should get uh, or, or you know expand the pilot, whether we would be buying 16 gigabytes uh, iPads from here on out. And then the other is just a, the, the last question is one I think that we have to tackle when we get to talking about once we see the data from the, the report that Hanover will do for us. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, well, I think that um, this has obviously been really informative and we're definitely uh, still kind of at the beginning of the process in some ways. Um, and in looking at this, you may have questions raised or some ideas of things that you'd want included in, in a next report. So please do email Dr. Cash with anything that you can think of. Um, thank you to the principals. Thank you so much to Ms. Mirabad here. And we have not met yet. And um, how do you pronounce your last name? Is M Muller? Muller. All right, very nice to meet you, and I, I know that you're becoming a critical part of the team as well. Um, and, you know, we have lots of parents that are impatient to move forward. I cannot say how grateful I am that we have moved forward as slowly as we have. This is the right pace. So um, thank you, and we'll look forward to hearing more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're now at, um, sorry, I'm just looking at, oh wow, that was, that was a long 15 minutes, wow. G3, presentation of draft 10-year preventative maintenance, renovation, and repair plan, Dr. Cash. Well, this is, the, we're gonna switch this, this'll be five minutes. All right. Depending on the number of questions that board members ask. I was like, I'm looking at this ask. board going, sure. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to um, quickly in my 30-second introduction is remind board members that part of what we talked about two years ago, in addition to the development of a facilities master plan, was the development of a long range maintenance, repair, and renovation plan. One that was sophisticated, one that was detailed, and one that would provide more information than the minimum state form that we fill out. Um, and one of the jobs that Teleku was given was the development of this plan. And with that, I'll introduce Dave Het Young. Thank you, Dr. Cash. Yes, uh, when the board authorized task two for Telecu, this was one of the, the tasks that they authorized for them to do. The two things they're doing besides uh, construction management for the district and keeping track of our financials is they're overseeing the uh, master plan that LPA is doing, and they're coming up with this uh, deferred maintenance schedule. So let me bring Kelly up. Uh, he is the the mastermind behind the schedule, uh, setting it up, uh, setting up the spreadsheet, starting to plug in numbers. But we wanted to have a presentation to the board to make sure that you had time early on in the process to comment about what the categories were and, and what format you'd like to see that in. So, Kelly? 
Yeah, I, one of the things I want to make clear is that this is a draft. We, we, what we don't want is too much detail or not enough detail. Because this is a document that you're going to be looking at, one that we would present to the public beyond our website that would clearly articulate how we plan to spend money to maintain our facilities. So. All right, thank you, Dr. Cash, President Parker, board members. Thank you for having me tonight. Well, as uh, David introduced and Dr. Cash introduced, this is a draft format. Uh, but there's uh, there's quite a bit of, a bit of layers that go on go into this, and uh, I don't want to just read from the PowerPoint. So I'm assuming you've all had a chance to read through it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So just a few high points as we as we go along. Uh, let's see, I just kind of talk down through the first part here. Of the, you know, there's a lot of specifics and a lot of very unique. Uh, Elements to the to the, the district, you know, both through, all the way through the the elementary, the secondary, the child development centers, the co-located schools, the fact that you have a lot of permanent buildings, a lot of portable buildings, and these things are all of different ages, and so they all need to be, be uh, evaluated each individual site, each individual building, and then within that building, there's things that have been done at different times, and that need some need more attention than others. So that's one uh, that's one uh, main element of this. Another thing is that. Uh, Let's see, we've gone. I don't know that you have the first page here, so I'll read a little bit off of that. I apologize, the first page is missing. We start right with the format there. But this thing rolls too, if you're not careful with it. <laughs> I'll see. That was me rolling it. Oh, okay. Can you roll me back to the first page? Certainly. Thank you. All right, appreciate that. Okay, so here they are. I didn't know if it was up there. The, uh, there's some goals and objectives we come up with, and something that's interesting, uh, item number seven there, is uh, some of these items should be able to be funded through uh, other sources, uh, such as Prop, the Prop 39 work that's being done with the energy efficiency assessment. One of our categories you'll see is classroom lighting. Well, uh, in discussions with, uh, with Mr. Hetyonk and others and your maintenance and operations people, we've discovered that you know, there's some low-lying fruit in, in that program that would take care of classroom lighting. So if you were to go through the spreadsheet that you have in your packet, you'll find under Franklin Elementary, you know, my, my example we've used, it's zero. Because I'm assuming that that's, for these purposes, that's going to be replaced with, that, with the Prop 39 program. So examples of different ways to fund <laughs> some of this. This uh, fund some of these needs. Uh, moving right down into the guiding principles, uh, pretty straightforward, but item number two, that well-maintained and equipped uh, facilities increase student learning, you know, using that as a, as a basis for the, the motivation here. And then um, the process, let's move right down to that. Uh, in the example you have, and Mr. Hayonk mentioned that we would like to present to you a draft in a, of the process. And then once we figure out that this is where we're going in the right direction with this, go and populate this out for all of the schools, all the buildings, all the sites, all the facilities, and do the inputs at that point. Uh, so uh, we have used Franklin as, a, as sort of an example, Franklin Elementary. Uh, it's got an old, an old building, that has, as they, many of them do, but older buildings that were built, the original school buildings right there off Yananali Street, and it's got some that were built about eight years ago. You know, the two classrooms, you're probably familiar with those, and the library. And then it has some elements that are being done in the Measure R program, and, and likewise other sites with Measure Q, and that's the multi-torium or the, the um, multi-purpose room modernization. So this is a really good one to do a study on. That's why I've chosen this. Also, I've got projects there, so I'm real familiar with it. So using that to our advantage. Uh, looking down at the process a little bit more, uh, you talked about the example and util utilizing the planning construction uh, department records or uh, the construction and planning department records. A lot of this is done in what we call the plan vault. Which is over is over here, you know, in the in the uh, in the warehouse building. There's a we go go through and look at what was done and at what years, and we we can start establishing the age of some of these elements, you know, some of these facilities, which I can talk about a little bit more later. And then we confirm that out in the field. You know, we might go out there and say, oh, well, modernization was done in this building in 2008, but we go out and we see the flooring has been replaced since then, for example. So need to field verify those things. A uh, categorical list. Um, Item number four is sort of important because uh, as you start to go down into the into the depth a little further on in this, how do I do that again? Just, no, it's not going. Okay, can you just page down? I'm sorry. Stop. 
Which page would you like? To uh, that one right there. Uh, that one. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, it's 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 kind of stuck, but uh, anyway, to uh, to make it brief, there's there's a roll-up page that collects all the information from each and every school site in each and every category, and uh, the categories that were, are used, the format is utilizes the um, the categories were on the deferred maintenance program before LCAP, and uh, those are listed on the handout I gave you. I don't know if you saw those: asbestos, lead abatement, classroom lighting, electrical, floor covering, HVAC, painting, plumbing, paving. Roofing and wall systems, and wall systems is a whole lot of things including the condition of the walls, doors, frames, and hardware, windows, and other things that are attached to the wall. So uh, with that being said, then we go to each individual, each individual school. Okay, that, there we go. So there's, there's a roll up by category. Uh, and then if we can go to the next page, please. Then this is a, a typical roll up for that category. And as you can see, uh, it has all the schools listed. All right, and so they all roll up. You'll also notice, I'm just down a little bit more, that we're, we're using a 10-year horizon on this, years one through five, and then five through 10, right? There's a good place to stop. And uh, what we're doing is introducing about a 5% per year escalation in the cost. And so once we determine that you know, it's gonna cost about $5,000 to replace the, uh, the kitchen ventilator, uh, the roof unit at Franklin, and if that's, that's about eight years, about 10 years old, so it needs to be done in five to seven years, we can figure out what it costs in today's dollars and, and then say how much it costs to replace seven years from now when it's due. So that's an easy way to add those up by year. And then uh, the, uh, if you can go back one more, please. Uh, one more back, please. And then the, uh, the fiscal year totals that'll be on the master roll-up page here will have all the inputs for each and every category, each and every school, there'll be a number right there. Uh, so that's the easy way to do all the inputs and show you what the budget would be for that year if you could do everything that would, we say would be needed in that year. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that happens along the way is we realize that we're gonna have capital campaigns along the way. And I don't know exactly when those are gonna be, or what the scope of those will be. So what, what can happen is the adjustability of this, it's, it's malleable in that, if, let's say you're gonna go in and do a, a general modernization of, oh say, a classroom building at a certain school, you say, well, I, I, then in that year, if that's set for replacement of mechanical units in 10 years, I don't need to replace that now in 10 years. Now I can back that into the appropriate year based on, you know, based on the year it'll be done or pull those elements right out of it. So, it's flexible and it could be reused. I would recommend that it be updated once a year and that it would be reviewed by, uh, by staff and, uh, and, and gone through uh, and confirmed what was done or what needs to be moved to a subsequent year. And that's very, very easy to do with the format. Uh, if you can go down, yeah, these are extended categorical pages for each category. They have all the schools and a few more, please. I don't want to bore you too much with all these. Uh, this is duplication, but you see there's a for each category. A little more, please. Okay. Until we get to, okay, this is a good place to stop there. So this is our example for Franklin and taking our first category, um, perfect. So you can see it's broken up in the left-hand column under category by building an area. And the uh, if there's anything that's been done or we know, we can make a, a notation on that and uh, we can assign a unit you know, a type of unit, a quantity, and a value per, per that unit. And if, if something needs to be done, why then we can put it, we can do the, the math into the year in which it should be done. And so uh, it's formulated so that the things that all belong in year one don't add up to a grand total just to year one and, and just to year two and so forth. So this is pretty dry, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I understand yeah. it is. Uh, a little so dancing video as part of it, but that's okay. Yeah, a little more exciting. So anyway, there's, there's uh, one for each category, and you can see I mentioned like the lighting, for example. When I, when I uh, consult with staff about this, and it looks like we are going to get, uh, you know, possibly be utilized in the mid, uh, Prop 39, then we won't add anything here. You can see the, uh, the number of units are, uh, there's no cost per unit. <laughs> I have the quantity of units of light fixtures in each room, but we don't have them input yet. So we can make those adjustments as, as we sit down and talk about this. Uh, electrical, again, you can see there's, for example, there's the multitorium building and there's different categories of things within that, you know, within that, and that's duplicated for each and every one of the school buildings, if you're familiar with the site. And, and, so, and so it goes all the way through those, those 10 categories I read to you. 
So uh, is this the right amount of detail or too much detail or? Well, it depends on what you mean by too much detail for whom. For you. For for us, um, I think it's I think it's good. I mean, I I think, I, I think we would love to have access um, to uh, to everything, um, and I'm presuming that um, when all the information is populated for every single school that there will be like a, a year total breakout so that you can yes. say, you know, in, in 2017, you really are going to need this amount of money spent on deferred maintenance. Um, yes? Yes, yes. So that's right. correct. The, the, the first page, the master roll-up page, provides that in the top line. Right. And that, of course, are, is arrived at by going through the detail with Mr. Visalini, Mr. Hetyonk, and Dave Thomas and the staff that you mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. Because obviously it's, a, it's super practical on, on the staff level, but also for us to be able to turn around and go to the public and say, look, if you, if you, if you are questioning how we are spending money on facilities mm -hmm. and, and on maintenance, you can instantly reference all the way through this. Right. It's it's a if someone wants to dig into the detail, it's certainly yeah. all there, and again, it rolls up for an easy summary. Ms. Edelson, um, I just have a question. So some schools are newer than others. Say Roosevelt's relatively new school to our district. If you had say a priority that something you know windows or say at Santa Barbara High are warping as we speak, <laughs> we're <laughs> we're going to need you know, them painted or they're going to have to be scrapped out. Um, are you going to prioritize what's critical per year or I know there's so many needs out there that um, to look at the entire district, where do you start? Well, th those are, there's two questions there that I heard. And the first one was how do we prioritize, you know, what needs to be done and when and what do we do in the case when there's something that, uh, that looks like it might fall apart soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but I'm also hearing in there a question you didn't ask is, and this is like the windows, for example. Uh, you know, there's no way you're going to replace those windows with a deferred maintenance program. It's just, they're too expensive. We kind of went through that with the assessment. Mm -hmm. you know, those will likely be deferred to an overall modernization on a future capital campaign. So what we would do in that case is we we put a per window um, unit amount for what you might take to maintain those during the during the years, and then they would be replaced with a capital campaign. Uh, the question about something like you know, what, how do we rate things? Well, we're doing that. We're saying it's either, it's either critical. There's a one through, a one through four um, rating system that's being developed. It's either critical, it's in, it's in good condition, it's in fair condition, or it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'm sorry, the other way around. It's either critical, it's in fair condition, it's in good condition, or it's in, it doesn't need to be worked on. Mm -hmm. So there is a rating system that's being employed. Okay. Um, Mr. Heron. Yeah, I think you just answered my question, but just to, just to follow up, uh, this is purely deferred maintenance. Things that typically would be on the bond list won't be part of this. Correct. Correct. Um, this this is typically the types of activities that you would see back previously before LCAP when the state sent down deferred maintenance and then we matched it and then they reduce their half because of budget cuts and we still had to have our half full and their half was three quarters full. But typically in the past we've used the limited funds that we've had to do things like replace carpet, um, replace water heaters when they failed, um, major roof leak fixes that wouldn't be typically maintenance where we'd have to redo a section of roof but not a whole building. Um, basically a, a lot of things to protect the building and keep it running. Uh, for deferred maintenance, you should be doing things on no less than a five-year cycle. In other words, we refinish our gym floors every other year. That would come out of routine restricted maintenance, not deferred maintenance, because we do it more <coughs> frequently than a five-year period. So, so that's one of the basics of being deferred maintenance. Um, painting would be a, a big item uh, on deferred maintenance. Uh, we could have, if we'd have had for the last 20 years, a lot of extra money for painting protected our buildings a lot better than we did now. Uh, you can also use deferred maintenance money for asbestos removal as part of a project or, or lead abatement, especially when painting. A lot of times in a painting project now with all the new restrictions, you're going to have lead abatement going on. So we come, I envision us coming to the board with priorities uh, uh, based on funds available or coming with a list and, and the board determines well we can have this much money and these are priorities and these things are going to fail and this is important this year. 
uh, we have a list in the maintenance department uh, of priorities for flooring replacement. We have some uh, uh, classrooms that are in dire need of new flooring. Uh, typically, uh, a lot of times we take what's carpet and, and make it tile to help with our cleanliness and, and our um, uh, airborne quality, or air control, and th things like that to help reduce mold and, and, and other problems that, that associated. But uh, Right now, we have a lot of plays. This, this carpet here is in great condition uh, uh, as far as that goes, even though it may look bad. But, but we have carpet that's thin, that's failing, that's frail, that's in dire need of replacement. And uh, a lot of our schools uh, need some work. And this will help us prioritize that so you'll have the information you can need to make decisions. That's what I was just going to mm -hmm. mention, is that presumably, if we have reserves at some point, we could take a look at what we have coming up the next year, the next two years, and say, okay, we're going to allocate out of our reserves funds for these purposes. And Correct. so we'd exactly. be ahead of the curve, not behind it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be what can we do with what we have left over, is what can we put in there to make sure we're taking care of what we have. Correct. But, but it's, not, it's not intended to uh, take the place of a capital campaign nope. for, for major renovations. It's, it's to try to keep things uh, rolling along. They, they take a, a little more work than your typical routine maintenance to keep things going. It'll allow us to plan, not react. Yeah, that's right. the t purpose of it. Thank is you. To plan. Yeah. And also, I think it's a I, one of the questions I get, and maybe I'm alone, is when will my school be painted? Constantly. <laughs> and so it would be nice to be able to have a schedule that would say, hey, you know, Adams is scheduled to be painted in 2018. Um, so just that sort of information. Yeah, so right now I'm imagining the whole school communities, if you actually give that number out, so marching on us. Yeah, Franklin's 2019-20. So yeah. okay, yeah. There you go. Dr. Paz? So when we're talking, we're talking about this, um, this plan, we're really talking about buildings, anything attached to the building, parking lots, playgrounds, et cetera. We're not including landscaping. Correct. So as we look at the current situation we're in right now in terms of drought and looking at uh, you know, the, the wider question I would have beyond this plan is what are we going to do with cer certain... I, I would imagine right now we are, we are challenged as a school district in terms of how much landscaping we have and the need to look at whether we want to replace it in the future to not deal with what we have right now in terms of drought conditions. Yeah. Yes. I, I think that's a big issue. Not to mention that I think we're going to probably have some landscaping that's just going to and die in the whole process eventually um, if it gets worse we could totally expect that so where does that come in where does that piece come in in terms of facilities no, that's, in that's a great question I've asked Ax, Ax, I've asked Mr. Hetyunk and his team to put together a plan where they will slowly take the decorative grasses out of our facilities palette mm -hmm. and I sound like a landscape architect. <laughs> Almost. Um, and replace them with more drought resistant, sustainable um, landscaping that requires less time by our staff and less water, less resources. And I know he's already started that. Yeah, and we're, and we're slowly going down that process. Uh, there, there's some areas at uh, Cleveland, there's some areas at uh, Franklin, there's some areas at La Colina that we're slowly taking out those pieces of grass between the wings of the building that don't get used for anything but looking at and, and replacing them with with more of a drought tolerant landscape but typically landscaping would not be a category historically within the definition of deferred maintenance not to say that it's not needed uh, to take some of our turf out of service and put something else in its place um, but maybe that is a, a future board conversation yeah. where we talk more specifically. I mean, obviously, we can talk about it in a drought context, but also, you know, really looking at a district-wide landscaping um, plan. Some more work to do. Um, all right. Well, I think that um, 
if there aren't any further questions or comments on it, I hope that we've given you enough feedback. Obviously, you could go into a lot more detail about this, but you know, generally speaking, I, I think that we thank you, but we also think you're definitely going in the right direction and that this is going to be a really valuable tool and something that should be accessible to the public and to us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When, it's, when it's completed, uh, we'll, we'll notify you, post it on the website, and begin communicating. Great. Thank you. Um, this brings us to G4, the um, Local Control Accountability Plan 2014-15 update. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, and I, since I'm the sole speaker here, I will do this quickly. Um, as promised, here is our update on the Local Control Accountability Plan. Um, here I have listed the activities that we have completed, the activities that we have started, and those that we have not started yet, along with the timeline for our process moving forward. So uh, one of the things that's wonderful about the Local Control Accountability Plan is um, the eight state priorities that we have to meet. And within that, eight, those eight state priorities are a total of 105 activities that must take place. I didn't list them all. So I listed examples of some of the things that we've done so far. Teachers credentialed and assigned. We've hired additional facility staff. We're reviewing assignments. We've done outreach to our Hispanic serving colleges and universities. We're using Teacher Match. We're going to get a presentation on Teacher Match and the work that we believe our evaluation of it to date. We've purchased materials. Um, we're deploying technology. You just heard about that. We've hired site-based instructional technology. That's been a fascinating process. Um, we're piloting the co-teaching model, which is, uh, I observed it in, I think, three or four classrooms today at Santa Barbara Junior High School. Um, we, uh, thanks to Mr. Handel's leadership, we changed the way that we're um, screening our English language learner students for GATE qualification. Uh, we've continued our ninth grade class size reduction in English language arts. We've expanded our restorative approaches. Um, to all of our high schools, all of our junior high schools and three elementary schools. We've hired the elementary school counselors and social workers that we wanted to. We're continuing to provide the parenting classes. We implemented the canine detection. We continue to use our SROs and we're providing safety at our athletic events and we not, not just maintained, we expanded the parent resource center. Um, and I'll just give you a, a taste of what's going to come forward um, s probably sometime in January, February, is we're going to be bringing for forward a proposal on uh, revitalization of the Parma Center. Part of that will include, we believe, a rehousing of the Parent Resource Center and a, and a, and a, a place that's easier to access. We've hired the, uh, Dr. Ramirez, our EL and parent engagement person. We've I believe doubled or 250% increase in our translation interpretation services and thanks to your approval, the strategic plan for VAPA has occurred. Some of the things that are in progress, the junior high school after school sports program um, under Mr. Handel's leadership and our science consultants, um, we have a lot of great work done in uh, implementing FOSS. The YSSs, we continue to use them. You just heard about the iPad deployment. Um, that iPad deployment's really working hard, not just in the areas you've heard, um, but also in Common Core Next Generation Science Standards. Done a lot of work in cultural proficiency. You heard Dr. Drotti's presentation recently in relationship to that. And uh, I have to tell you, the, uh, the surveys, the results, and I think they're predominantly right now from the elementary teachers, yes. right? For the TOSA's work in the, in the um, have been off the chart, um, fantastic, supportive, and I'd be happy to share those with you if you'd like to read them yourselves, but they've been really, really, really supportive of that work. In fact, most of them, most of what I read is they, they want to make sure they have more time to work with them. We're, one of the things you haven't heard a lot about yet because we want to get it going correctly is our expansion of the community of schools model to Santa Barbara Junior, Santa Barbara High School, Cleveland, and Franklin. Um, all of our principals believe that the PSAT and the plan for 10th and 11th graders, they, Sean Carey believes our 12 Hispanic uh, scholars was a direct result of having all those kids take the PSAT. We're continuing PAR. You just saw the maintenance renovation scheduling. Uh, you'll be getting soon our uh, climate survey, um, so you can take a look at that. 
Um, you'll also be getting soon the uh, new criteria that we're establishing for reclassification for English learners. I think that will be at our next board meeting. Uh, what we haven't done yet, we haven't started the after school LD instruction. We have not researched or piloted uh, a model of acceleration. We still have not trained the staff on A through G. We haven't uh, trained the staff on uh, what are the current, what would be the appropriate modifications for the new state assessment. Um, we haven't completed the transition handbook. We haven't created the literacy food clubs. Um, we haven't developed the action plan. I'm kind of waiting to see if we get, that would probably be the VAPA coordinator. I wouldn't want to substitute my judgment or the judgment of someone that's not an expert. We haven't reviewed the district wellness plan, though it is on an upcoming board meeting agenda. Uh, we haven't evaluated the effectiveness of the RF expansion, though we are in the process. So we will be doing that and presenting it to you. And we haven't done these other things. One of the, um, and we, haven't evalu we haven't conducted an evaluation in relationship to what gets people to graduation and what doesn't. We haven't had the opportunity yet to train all staff on positive behavior interventions or develop the teacher academy at a high school. How's that for a quick update? <laughs> nice, thank you. What I want to do is very briefly go over the timeline. As I think President Parker said to me, the LCAP is ever present. <laughs> well, I said, you know, so when do we start the process again? You're like, it's already started. <laughs> so, yes. So we're in phase one right now, which is our needs assessment data collection. And I want to remind you that we really look at these areas, conditions of learning, pupil outcomes, and engagement of our students and our parents. So our assessment of that will be completed by December 1st. Then we go into phase two, where we inform and consult with our community. We'll hold our voluntary staff meetings. We'll have student meetings, grades four through 12. We'll have the parent meetings that we had last year. Um, there'll be site parent meetings. Uh, my LCAP PAC, uh, I, I have some new members in that. Um, we'll meet again and go over that. And that'll be, that'll be completed by February 1st. Then we'll go into phase three, which is the draft of the LCAP. Dr. Drotty is the chair of the LCAP committee again. Um, he's very thankful for that opportunity to do that again for the second year. Um, and the LCAP committee will complete the first draft and it'll all be based on the needs assessment, all the information and con all the feedback that we've gotten. Um, and they'll complete that draft by March 1st. Then we go back out to the community with the draft. Um, in phase four, and that's the, what the law requires is that specifically parent advisory groups, so we'll I'll be at the DLAC, the PAC, the LCAP PAC, we'll do regional meetings again, be on the website, we'll do e-news, and I'll do all the other uh, kind of informal consultations with faith leaders, with PTA, PTO, Chambers of Commerce, um, and that needs to be completed by April 14th because that will be the first public hearing. Uh, before the board April 14th, 2015. Then we move into pit phase five, which is uh, public hearings and board adoption. April 14th, first public hearing. I wanted to give us a month in between the first and the second if there were significant changes that needed to be made for the second one. And then in June, uh, the board will adopt the LCAP for the 2015-16 school year. So that's the timeline moving forward. Okay, any questions on it? Ms. Simone? I just have a comment. Um, this is very extensive and I don't know if it's been said publicly, but as I understand, this has also been recognized at the state level as being an example of a very thorough, involved, engaged LCAP. So kudos to the district um, for uh, all the work that went into this. One of the suggestions I have is for 2015, we have joint meetings with um, other government agencies, including the City of Santa Barbara, Goleta, and our community college. I would love for, um, I think in 2014, we talked broadly about LCAP, but I would love for 2015 at those meetings to actually pull out of the 105 activities that we are doing, which are relevant to that particular governing body. Because um, I think there's room for partnership, and I also think that if we were very specific and clear, we might be able to leverage um, opportunities Great of idea. sorts with those. Great idea. So We'll do. Dr. Paz. I know I've asked for this before, but it would be really helpful for for the board and the public to look at how the LCAP aligns with their strategic plan. 
the very least maybe some broad categories of looking at that so we could do a crosswalk and see that um it's I, in the, it's in the um it is in the lcap okay we specifically identify the parts of the okay. of it but we could try to synthesize that and reduce it to a that would be good. shorter document yeah thank you Oh, actually, in fact, I think, didn't we do that in the, it's in the PowerPoint. Yeah, it's done. I'll, do, I'll share with you the PowerPoint presentation. Great, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, a lot to do, a lot to do over again. So, thanks. We'll see that again soon. Um, this brings us to item G5, first reading of board policies and ARs in um, two series, 1114, which is district-sponsored social media, and then in 3100, budget. Um, do board members need, have any suggestions for changes to either the BPs or the ARs in those two documents? Ms. Simone. So I just have a question for AR1114, which is the social media one. This whole idea about not, I mean, we can't control Santa Rosa High School class of 2018 Facebook page. But is there some language that we could suggest that they include? This page is not affiliated with the school district of sorts. And I think back to actually UCSB has this um, situation happen a lot and um, it actually presented a problem unfortunately in the whole um, Ivy tragedy thing and I was one of the people answering phones and I was shocked at how many people were calling about websites that were not UCSB sponsored so I just wonder we can't require them but could we come up with a sentence That's, that we yeah. could suggest that they put on the on these other forms of communication absolutely great yeah. thank you all right, but that's not a change to any of this wording. The only Mr. question I have, it, it seemed like there's an awful lot of oversight in AR1114. Who's going to do it? I mean, it's, it's out there all over the place. It just seems like it's almost an impossibility. All administrators will be responsible for that. That means... That nobody. No, doesn't mean anyone. <laughs> no, but it would be. I would be. We would hope that the administration at Santa Barbara High School would be our first primary point of contact, and then following them would be Dr. Drotti and Mr. Torina, and myself. That's what we would do, along with Barbara Chiani providing guidance as well. And I would add that you'd be surprised how many members of the public will probably be the first to alert us to something that's on the page. Yeah. So it's just the nature of That's what I was going to say. This is, this is such a big undertaking, and you don't know what you don't know. Like you found out, unfortunately, in that tragedy until someone calls and says, oh, there's this site that's pretending to be you or claiming to be, you know, uh, the Santa Barbara School District. That, that stuff we cannot control. We can only do so much. And even with the things that we do know about, you're right, uh, Mr. Heron, it would take somebody full time looking at sites constantly and, and we're going to depend uh, on the, the professionalism of our staffs and, uh, and our principals to occasionally look in on those, but it's gonna, we're going to find out about things once we're, we receive phone calls. All right, any wording changes on any of these documents? Is it all right then if um, ARBP 1114 and ARBP 3100 come back on a consent agenda? All right, we will look forward to that at our next meeting. Um, we don't have any consent items to come back to. We've talked about c coming events, um, future agenda items. We have the resolution coming back. Um, that should be coming back at the, at the November meeting. That's the suggested Revenue language. Limit. Yeah. Revenue limit. The, uh, the um, reserve. Reserve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the yeah. one that you suggested. The one that you suggested. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Heron. <laughs> um, any other ones? We've recently gotten the list, so we can review that again if we need to. And we do have a meeting tomorrow, a special board meeting on, um, it's, it's really a workshop, a special education workshop at 4 p.m. at Santa Barbara High School cafeteria. 
and then we only have one meeting in November. It's going to be November 18th, starting with our single plan workshop. Um, that's going to start at 4 o'clock. And then the regular board meeting will start at 6.30. Okay, I do want to give a special shout out before we say goodbye to Bill Gurley from Goleta Valley Junior High School, the industrial yeah. tech teacher there who made these for Yay. us. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Gurley. This is awesome. Uh, and we're also appreciative of, appreciative of it. And um, Mr. Heron? I would like to invite everyone who has an opportunity to come to the Adelante um, Dia de los Muertos celebration Sunday from uh, 11 to 4. I think you all have received information on that, but it's always a day of fun, and it's uh, good, good to get your Zumba you know, ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, with no objection from my fellow board members at this point, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Okay.